Hello everyone, assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the third webinar of our knowledge building series featuring Musawa's research initiative titled Reclaiming Adil and Ihsan in Muslim Marriages Between Ethics and Law. Thank you for joining us from all over the world. We're really honored by your presence and support. And I hope that wherever you are joining us from, you and your family are safe and healthy. My name is Sarah Marso, and I'm the coordinator of Musawa's Knowledge Building Working Group, and I will be the housekeeper for today's event. With this series of webinars, we are trying to open new digital spaces for building and sharing feminist knowledge on family relations. The topics are evolving around the diverse, plural, and flexible understandings of marriage practices, laws, and ideals in Muslim context. With the first two webinars, we had the chance to dive deep into the fiqh tradition. Our scholars, Dr. Naveen Reda and Dr. Mohsen Kadivar, gave us some key tools to understand and explore usul al-fiqh while revisiting fiqh rulings and marriage. And you can watch these two webinars in our YouTube channel. Today, Dr. Huda al Saadi will take us on a journey throughout history to unearth Muslim women's voices and marriage practices in pre-modern Muslim Egypt. Dr. al Saadi is a fascinating historian and she will be in conversation with two amazing activists, Aisha Roiker and Zaina Anwar. So we have all of the ingredients for an exciting and enlightening webinar that hopefully will speak to some of the pressing issues in your different context. So before I hand over to our beloved Zaina Anwat, who will be the moderator for this session, I have a few housekeeping items to share with you. So I would like to have, make sure we have the right slide. So the webinar is also being live streamed by our Facebook page and will be available on our YouTube channel. Participants joining us on Zoom will be able to ask questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. If we don't get to your question during today's webinar, please don't hesitate to get in touch with us via the email that is on the screen. Please do not use the chat function to ask questions. Only use it if you are experiencing technical difficulties and I will be there to assist you. In the chat box, we will also be sharing resources and reference material that the speakers refer to, and we will also share them in our website afterward. If you are tweeting and posting about the webinar, please don't hesitate to tag us at Musawa on Twitter and at Musawa Movement on Facebook and Instagram. Now let me introduce you to our moderator. Zaina Anwar co-founded two groundbreaking women's groups that engage with Islam from a rights perspective to promote the rights of women living in Muslim context. She's a co-founder of Sisters in Islam, a non-governmental organization working on Muslim women's rights in Malaysia and led it from 1999 to 2008. She's currently the founding executive director of Musawa, the global movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. We are very honored to have Zaina here moderating this discussion. Thank you. And now I'm going to hand over the webinar to you, Zaina Jan. Zaina, you need to unmute yourself first. Sorry. <laughs> OK, sorry. Um, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon for people from different time zones and different parts of the world. Um, thank you, Sarah, for that kind introduction. Welcome, everyone, to this third Musawa Knowledge Building webinar series on our new research initiative on reclaiming Adil, justice, and Ihsan, beauty, goodness in Muslim marriages between ethics and law. Our first research initiative, which was five years long, we produced the book, Men in Charge, Rethinking Authority in Muslim Legal Tradition. That research initiative investigated the root causes of gender inequality in our tradition. That was our deconstruction phase that enabled us to understand how knowledge was produced in our legal tradition that led to a legal framework that regarded women as inferior to men. And unfortunately, this legal framework still underpins the Muslim family laws that govern us today. In this new initiative, we enter our reconstruction phase where we want to find solutions, possibilities for ethical and legal frameworks for Muslim marriages based on partnerships of equals, based on justice, on mutual care and giving. The first two webinars, as Sarah mentioned, discuss the works of two of our scholars on marriage and fiqh jurisprudence. From this textual analysis of fiqh and its traditions, 
we shift the focus today to understanding the historical realities on the ground that gave birth to law and practice that regulated marriage in pre-modern Islamic Egypt from the 8th to the 18th century. So why is history important and relevant to us today, to our continuing struggle for equality and justice for women living under Muslim laws, not least Muslim family laws? With us today to share her exciting research is Dr. Hoda El Saadi from the American University in Cairo and a co-founder of the Women, Women and Memory Forum in Egypt. She specializes in early and medieval Islamic history with a specific interest in gender issues in the Islamic tradition. In Islamic history to highlight and analyze women's presence in public life before the pre-modern period, exploring their changing roles through the ages. She considers her work to be a form of resistance, and you'll find that out tonight, against the process of exclusion and marginalization from which women suffered in various historical periods. I was really excited to discover Dr. El Saadi's research as it debunks two major myths that prevail until today, used and abused to resist the demands for reform, for change in how we understand Islam and use it as a source of law and practice that govern our lives. First, Dr. El Saadi debunks the myth that Islamic law is divine law that cannot be changed, questioned or reformed. Second, she debunks the myth of the helpless Muslim woman with no rights and no agency. Women in the medieval period, in fact, had agency to negotiate the kind of marriages they wanted and would sue their husbands or dissolve the marriage if the husbands failed to fulfill the conditions set. From papyrus marriage contracts from early Islamic Egypt to Ottoman legal records, all surviving in the original forms, Dr. El Saadi uses her gender lens to explore these historical sources on marriage norms and practices, unearthing key traditions and practices for us all to engage with today. This is particularly important as Musawa for us in Musawa as we have just launched the Campaign for Justice in Muslim Family Laws that brings together activists, academics, policymakers in South and Southeast Asia, the MENA region and Sub-Saharan Africa to build global support and global momentum on the urgency of family law reform. Dr. El Saadi's evidence-based findings that Islamic law is plural, flexible and responsive to the realities on the ground and that women's voices and experiences impacted law form formulation and enforcement are critical to our campaign for justice and for law reform. We all look forward to an exciting discussion before us. Joining Dr. El Saadi as a discussant will be Ms. Aisha Royka from South Africa, a single mother of three sons, a paralegal who is completing her LLB and an activist with the Muslim Personal Law Network, which is working closely with Musawa in our campaign for justice in Muslim family laws. Aisha's personal struggle for her rights has made her a passionate advocate speaking out on the effects of the non-recognition and non-regulation of Muslim marriages in her country. Welcome Hoda, welcome Aisha, welcome all of you um, in different parts of the world. Welcome to this webinar. So let us begin. So my first question, Hoda. Hoda, we all know that in many parts of the Muslim world, women's rights activists demanding reform of discriminatory Muslim family laws are often demonized as people who are against God, against Islam, against Sharia. Your historical research is critical to our work for reform. Do share with us some of your key findings on the dynamism of Islamic law in the medieval period and how 
it was responsive to the social norms and customs of the time. And it was produced by diverse actors interacting with each other and who had differences of opinion. That in effect, Islamic law regulating marriage is a social construction. It is not divine. It is not immutable as claimed. So do share with us how you reach these um, very critical conclusions. Hoda? You have to unmute yourself, Hoda. You're still muted, Hoda. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay, yeah. right. Yeah. Thank you, Can thank you, Dina, and I'm really, really delighted to be part of this great initiative of Musawa. Uh, your question is very, very interesting, and I'd like to start by Islamic law, and uh, is Islamic law equated with fiqh? Many, many, many people would equate Islamic law with fiqh, and uh, believing that fiqh is the only source of Islamic law. Uh, yes, fiqh is a very important source for Islamic law, yet it's not the only one, because there is another source, and it is siyasa sharia. And what is siyasa sharia? Siyasa sharia is the, uh, these are the decrees and the policies of the rulers uh, in order to regulate society. And since the very beginning of Islam, caliphs were involved in regulating societies uh, there is the case of Umar ibn al-Khattab, uh, rules regulating relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. And uh, this continued throughout time. Uh, yes, sultans and caliphs and rulers were uh, more involved in the public policy and in regulating the public space. Yet, uh, when we go to medieval time, we find sultans and rulers regulating uh, the domestic life and uh, involved in uh, regulating gender and marital relations. So this is another source of law that is important and we should keep in mind. Uh, the other thing is when we think of Islamic law, it's not only uh, the, the formulation of the law, it's not only on the level of the formulation of the law. In fact, it goes to the level of uh, the enforcement of the law, which is very important. And uh, who enforces the law? We have the Qaji in his court, we have the, the Sultan in the Mazalim courts, we have the Muhtasib, who's a market inspector in the market. We have the military courts in the medieval period where military men resided over courts. Uh, and uh, all these, we have also the tribal sheikh, we have the village head or village sheikh. Uh, but definitely the, 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 the biggest or the most uh, enforcers of law were the Qajis. But anyway, all enforcers of law are human beings and they enforce the law according to their, they are influenced in enforcing the law by their background, by their uh, interests, by their uh, context. And uh, uh, if you look into history, you find the different, uh, and if you look into the courts and the, the, the negotiations that took place in the courts between the litigants and the, and the Qaji, you see how the Qaji applied the law in a way to meet the needs of his litigants or to meet the needs of his society. Um, there's another uh, important element in enforcing the law. There are the people, the people who were regulated by the rules. How did they react towards the, 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 these rules? Did they defy them? Did they uh, obey them? They also are important actors in the Islamic law scene. So Islamic law is big, it involves different levels and it has more than one source. Now, if we focus on the jurists or the fuqaha as a main source for Islamic law, we find that fuqaha or religious scholars, jurists, did not speak in one voice. They themselves had different uh, opinions. They themselves have different views. Uh, they interpreted the Quran according to the context they are living in. They wrote manuals that reflected their reality and their societies. And they were aware of this and respected this. Uh, they formulated rules according to their context and to, their, uh, to the customs and the norms of their society. Uh, they differed from one school to the other. 
and they differed even within the same school from one geographical location to the other and from one time chronologically to the other. I can bring here an interesting case uh, that, that shows clearly the differences among the Fuqaha and how they differed over uh, issues uh, not only from one school to the other, but even in the same school. Um, I can bring here the case of the Sadaq. And what is the Sadaq? The Sadaq is the, the gift given by the groom to his bride. And the Sadaq is stated clearly in the Quran. However, the mode of payment and the uh, amount of payment was not mentioned in the Quran. And we find that in the Maliki school, the Fuqaha stated that uh, the Sadaq is an amount of money that is given or a gift that is given to the bride at the time of consummation of marriage. This was the case with the Maliki Fuqaha in Medina. Yet, in Egypt, the Maliki Fuqaha tailored the rule in a different way. And they said that the Sadaq is to be given on two installments. An early installment at the time of consummation and another portion that is to be deferred to the termination of the marriage, either by divorce or by death. Uh, we read about clashes between the, fuqha, the Maliki Fuqaha of Medina and the ones in Egypt. Uh, they are Fuqaha living at the same time, but in different uh, geographical locations and each one insisted on a practice, a different practice. So the ones in Egypt, uh, if we, history helps here, uh, one would like to understand why the Fuqaha of Egypt insisted on this uh, division of the Sadaq. Uh, and if we look into the history of Egypt before Islam, pre-Islamic Egypt, this was the common practice. In Roman Egypt, for example, they had uh, a hidna, and what's the hidna? It's an amount of money that was given to the bride or to the wife at the time of termination of the marriage. And uh, this was the common practice among the people of Egypt during the Roman time. Also, if we look into the Jewish community of Egypt before Islam, they had uh, a term called shakht, actually I'm not sure of the pronunciation, but it was also an amount of money that the husband vows to pay to the wife in case of uh, termination of the marriage by divorce or by death. So here, the Maliki Fuqaha of Egypt were keeping in mind the context and then the norms and the customs of the Egyptians and trying to tailor this Sadaq rule according to the practices of the society and according to the norms and customs of the society. They respected the customs of Egypt and tried to tailor an Islamic rule according to what people were used to do. So this is the, uh, the, 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 the concept of the, uh, how, how, or it's an example, I mean, a case of how rulers differed from one uh, context to the other. Uh, and, and here, as I said, history comes important because it gives us the reasons why the law was formulated in such a way. Uh, there are other examples, many examples like the, the concept of equity in marriage, kafa in marriage, and how it is very big in the Hanafi, they stress it in the Hanafi school of law because it is the, uh, it, it came out from Iraq and uh, Iraq with its cosmopolitan nature and its hierarchical society. Uh, this concept of kafa'a uh, fitted very much in it and it, it, it met the needs of the society. Um, now, uh, the, the, the clashes, as I said, were not only, the clashes were not only between uh, fuqaha each and each other were not between schools of law, but it was also, it was taken to another level between the fuqaha, the jurists and the qadi, between the uh, formulation of the law and the practice of the law. Did the qada in their courts apply the law as stated in the manuals? Not always. And there are cases of clashes between faqih and qadi. We have a case, an interesting case of a qadi uh, in Egypt and he is known by the name of Hanafi Qadi, Hussein al-Din al-Ghuri, who uh, used to stand by the women, by the side or support women in the courts. 
And uh, whenever a woman uh, files a case against her husband or sues the husband uh, asking for her rights, uh, financial rights, he would support the wife and put the, the husband in jail. And this alarmed many jurists like Ibn uh, Qayyim al-Jawziyya or Ibn Taymiyyah who were really alarmed by this uh, 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 by the by the college's support of the women in the, the, the in the court and believed or saw this as a threat to the patriarchal uh, structure of the family and as i said there are many many other cases where the application of the law or the college's enforcement of the law did not very much uh, fit with the theory or with the rules uh, of the uh, of the faqih uh, just to expand quickly on uh, the enforcement of the law, uh, the qajis, as I said, were not the only ones enforcing laws, but there were many other courts like the Mazalim, like the military courts, and they were all part of this, uh, of, of the enforcement of the law, and they were all active players and active actors in the uh, scene of Islamic law. Okay, that's it. Uh, Zina? Zaina, you yes. need to unmute yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, yeah, these are really exciting and important historical facts you're sharing um, with us. And Islam certainly did not exist in a vacuum. Uh, the Fuqaha did not just exist in a world of text, of words, of language, yeah, and there were so much differences among themselves, and then, and I think importantly also that they never expected their legal opinions to be definitive and forever binding on everyone until today, as we are told, yeah, so, and as Islam spread and Muslims encountered um, new local customs and legal systems, the fuqaha and the judges responded to the context of their time and place. But your work is also critical to our campaign for reform today because you also looked at non-conventional sources of Islamic history. As we know, his story is always written by men by the victors, by those in power and authority. So women's own voices were not heard. Men represented them. But women had agency and rights, as you found out, even in the medieval period. What are these non-conventional historical sources that you use to unearth these women's voices and their status? What, what did these documents tell us about marriage um, practices in the medieval times and how women resisted injustice and negotiated their rights? Do share with us some of these findings that you made, very, very exciting and interesting findings that you made. Yes, thank you. Yes, okay. Uh, uh, history uh, history uh, gives us the, you know, when we look into legal sources, we get one angle of what was taking place. But history gives us the second angle. It gives us the, the angle, it focuses on the lived reality. How was law practiced? How were the fuqaha tailoring their laws to meet their societies? How were the people reacting to these laws? How was the law enforced? The lived reality of the law. Uh, and his history gives us this uh, angle. However, the problem with the history sources is that, as you said, they are written by men. And yes, women were represented in history sources. Yes, we have a huge number of women in history books. But the problem is that we do not hear the voice of the woman. We hear her voice through only the, uh, the, 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 the men's writings. And uh, in order, to hear the voice of women and see them in real life, we have to check non-conventional sources. And what do I mean by non-conventional sources? It's the, the sources that were not written by the intention of recording history. History was recorded uh, and uh, there's always an agenda behind history. It was recorded uh, by people in power, by the men. But if we look to non-conventional sources, we can get to a better uh, understanding or we can get to know more of what the dynamics of the, the lived reality, the dynamics of the real world. 
And what are the non-conventional sources? We have court records. In the courts, we can hear the voice of the women loud. We can see her asking for her rights. Uh, we can see her defying the, 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 the judge or the Qadi. We can see her suing her husband. So in court records, the voice of women is heard. Uh, other examples of non-conventional sources that I used in, in my research are the haram collections and what are they? Uh, these are uh, iqrars or deeds or collection of deeds that were collected from uh, the court of a Qadi in uh, Jerusalem, a 14th century Qadi. And uh, they are very important because in Mamluk period, we don't have court records. It's the Ottoman period that has the court records. Uh, before Mamluk, we don't have court records, but we have something like the Haram collections. These are iqrars from a Qadi's, Qadi's court. We have waqf documents. And what are the waqf documents? These are endowment deeds uh, that uh, showed us how women were active. They had uh, financial uh, independence. They had money of their own that they donated for charity. And they were managing their own endowments, not only donating the money, but the, the deeds prove to us or show us that these women were managing their own uh, endowments. Now we have also the Geniza documents and these are Jewish documents or Jewish records that were found in uh, uh, a medieval uh, synagogue in Fustat. And they record daily activities of the Jewish community. Yes, they apply to the Jewish community, but the Jews were not living in isolation. They were interacting with the Muslims and if we look into the marriage practices of the Jews in medieval time, we find so much common and parallel between them and the Islamic uh, practices, which can tell us how uh, the both communities affected each other. And uh, we can see how in real life, uh, there are these, um, how, how, how communities have an impact on one another and this uh, helps or it works on developing the rules of each one of the two communities. And then the, the last uh, uh, source here, which is actually the most important, it's the papyri marriage contracts. And these are marriage contracts going back to the very, very early Islamic time, Islamic Egypt, and they uh, record, uh, the, 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 they give us the contracts uh, the marriage contracts that uh, that took place between uh, members Muslims in the community in this early Islamic period. And here is an example of uh, a marriage contract between a man and a woman and how the, 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 the sadaq was uh, divided into portions and what the wife asks for her conditions. You can see that she's putting conditions in the marriage contract. She's asking for the good treatment. She's asking for uh, her right of monogamy, that her husband does not marry, take a second wife. And in case he takes a second wife, she has the right to divorce him of the second wife. So this document can show us the, 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 how women had a voice, how they were aware of the rights and how they uh, were vocal about the rights. Okay, so they had the awareness and they had the uh, agency and uh, were active, they were proactive. She would state her rights in a marriage contract. Okay. Uh, and then uh, we can go to uh, what kind of marriage practices that really uh, got my attention in the historical sources. The, the, the most important one is the conditions in the marriage, the ones like the ones we've seen in the, 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 the contract uh, that was shown right now. Women had their conditions. They were very clear about their conditions. And as we said, uh, if the husband is not did not fulfill them, she has the right to get a divorce. Uh, the Hanbali school said that these conditions are binding. Other schools said it's not, but the Hanbali said they are binding. And we find or we see that the wives did marry, many women would go and marry by the Hanbali school simply to have their conditions binding and to force the husband to uh, abide to these conditions. Uh, 
Uh, there's another thing, interesting thing that I got from the, the sources, and it is the monetization of marriage. What do we mean by monetization of marriage? Uh, cash value was added to the marriage in medieval Egypt. So the sadaq that was given was a, a sum of money to be given at the termination of the marriage. The women started asking for the right to get the deferred portion of sadaq upon request during the marital years. And they would go to courts and ask for this right. And they got this right. And the husband has to pay the sadaq upon request whenever the wife wants it. To add more, the, the support of the husband to the wife. The husband was, support, was supposed to give the, the wife support by providing her with food and clothes. In the medieval time, the wives started to ask for this support in cash and not in uh, in kind. And we started having this uh, creditor wife and the debtor husband. He owes her, he owes her the support money in cash. He owes her the, the deferred portion upon her request. And that's why in the medieval time, we did see many uh, wives suing their husbands in the court and asking for this financial, for their financial rights. And if he does not give the rights, he is, there are cases that he, in which he was imprisoned. The other point that was interesting also is the financial independence of women. History sources show us that women were financially independent, they were economically active, and they were very big when it comes to endowment. But actually the endowment was the, the for rich women, for the women of the elite, okay? And women of the elite, they had uh, their inheritance, they had their, uh, their, their marital gift, and uh, they had wealth, they had money, they invested in uh, business. What about the non-elite women? The non-elite women were engaged in uh, small uh, businesses, they were engaged in uh, small crafts, and in the medieval time, in the 14th and 15th century Egypt, women were really big when it comes to textile industry. They worked in this textile industry and their number was huge. And this involvement in the textile industry gave them uh, an edge, gave them uh, financial independence. And it's quite interesting to see that in medieval Egypt, the number of divorce cases soared high because women had financial independence and we link it to this uh, textile industry and the involvement of women in this industry. A huge number of women had economic independence, so the, the, the wife would not stay in a marriage that does not suit her and they opt for divorce. And there's a very big number of uh, female households or households that were managed by the mother or by the wife and uh, she would do well on her own. Uh, the, the other uh, point that I'd like to uh, go through before the end of my time, and it's the marginalization of the practice of polygamy. Uh, today, we believe that the practice, the common practice throughout history was uh, polygamy. In fact, history gives us another image, not always. For example, in medieval time, the, the common practice was monogamy. And polygamy was only common for travelers, for merchants who would travel for long uh, and, and be away from their ha houses for months and years. But it was not the common practice for the other common people. And uh, Mamluk uh, sultans set actually this rule. They themselves, many of them had monogamous uh, marriages. And uh, this was the common practice. So it's interesting here that History makes us, uh, gives us another, uh, when we look into history, we get another uh, image or we can get to know alternative, we can deduce alternative knowledge than what we believe in or what uh, people in power try to propagate or people who have the authority try to propagate or try to make it common. Okay, uh, that's it, Zina. Th thank you, Huda. these are all, really amazing stories of women who are empowered and had agency. And I'm sure many of our um, listeners are surprised actually about the papyrus marriage contract. I remember when I first heard um, about this through the work of Amira Sonbol, another historian, Egyptian historian, 
I mean, we were just like all shocked, yeah, that actually from the earliest period of Islam, women put in their marriage contract that their husbands do not have the right to take a second wife. And if he takes a second wife, she has a right to divorce her. And I remember reading that the Ottoman, in, during the Ottoman period, this condition of no polygamy and right to divorce should the husband take a second wife was actually the most popular condition in the marriage contract written during that period. So really in the end, what do all this mean to the work of women's rights activists today in our campaign for justice and equality in Muslim family laws? What is the relevance of these research findings for our contemporary times and for the struggle for justice today? What lessons can we learn, Hoda, from the work that you've been doing on this? Yeah, uh, I, I would say that uh, it's, it's very important to look into the lived reality and to understand that um, the, the diversity, first of all, to look into the diversity of the legal sources and to understand that uh, jurists did not speak in one voice. And the jurists of early times that people today refer to, they themselves and many of them uh, were respectful of this diversity. And the other thing is history. And the Islamic civilization is really broad. And people in power tend to pick and choose. And this is the, the, the problem with history, we tend to be selective. We select from history what suits our interest. We left the space for people in power to select what suits their interest. And I think it's time now for women to look into history and come up with what makes the position better. And there's so much, but it depends on who's selecting. Do you know, this is the main issue with history. It's huge, it's very big. Actually, the past is even more than history, but history was recorded by men and they selected from the past. So it's time now for women to look into the past and select what uh, is good for their own position. This is one thing. The other thing is the, the diversity and the uh, responsiveness of the Islamic law or of the fiqh in specific, uh, how it adapted to the customs and the norms, how it met the needs of the society, how it varied from one location to the other, how it varied by time. All this uh, shows us that fiqh was responsive and, if it, and it was adaptable and it was changing uh, and the fuqaha had no problem in this. So why do we have a problem today? And this, uh, is it has the mechanism and it has the tools for change. So this can help today in changing the rules and the laws that has to do with women or the society in general. Uh, the other thing that we get from history is um, once we read history, we get to see that the role of the women was not religiously fixed and that it has changed it has changed from time to time. It, has, it was tied to the political power. It was tied to the economic factors. So the position, there's nothing like, this is the image of the women. What women are you talking about? What women over 14 centuries? What women in an empire that extended from uh, the Atlantic to Asia? Uh, what, what class of women? Uh, is it the elite, the non-elite, the educated, the non-educated? Uh, what age group? So. People tend to uh, simplify things in a way that uh, it, it, they lose their, their importance. No, the Islamic empire is huge. It has all the, 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 the examples and the cases of different women, hundreds and thousands of women. And uh, it depends on your position in life and what you want to bring out from history. And I would say it's time now for women to have agency and to pick what really uh, benefits them from history. Uh, the other thing is uh, we can see from history that women had agency. They were vocal about their, what, what they want. They were clear about their position. They, uh, they, they go to court. They write conditions. They did not have an agent when they went to court. In many cases, they spoke for themselves. And uh, I, I would say this is what we need to emulate today. We uh, it's people and communities constitute their identities by uh, through history. And women have to be active in this. They have to constitute their identity and constitute the community's identity 
through history. So we need, they have to be involved in the production of knowledge. They have to produce alternative knowledge uh, to, to bring a better egalitarian society today. They can, the, the, the fact that um, fiqh was not only the source of law, that siyasa sharia was another source. Okay, what is equivalent to siyasa sharia today? The parliament, okay, women are in the public space today. They can vote, they can change rules, and they have to be active in this. Because all this is taken, this is not new to, our, to us, to our communities. We had this in, in our tradition. So uh, the, it's the agency of women in history. It's the fact that her role was never fixed, religiously fixed. These are the important things that we need to ponder on today and to reflect on in order to, to move forward. Okay, that's it, Jane. Absolutely, Hoda. These are all incredibly important lessons for us to take on and to learn. Um, and especially for those of us who live in Muslim contexts, you know, and who are governed by laws, um, policies, practices made in the name of Islam that really make no sense to the realities of our lives today, in fact, cause us harm cause the family harm, cause the children harm, cause the community well-being harm. But I guess, you know, the, the, the big challenge for us is the point that you also made in, in, in your um, research paper that, um, you know, and what you say today that Islamic law today remains the monopoly of male scholars you know, who insist that laws governing marriage and divorce come from texts and manuals reflecting the realities of a different age. But you know, and, and, and as you said, look, you know, there were differences of opinion, even in that different age, yeah, there were so much debate and so much differences and the fukaha and the judges were really, um, you know, responsive to the realities on the ground. So the important thing today, the challenge for us is really this monopoly of who has knowledge, who has the right and the authority to speak on Islam, to interpret Islam, to understand Islam, to codify a particular understanding of Islam into law and public policy. We have to break that monopoly that the men, the male scholars claim to have and the patriarchs in our society claim, claim to have. This monopoly must be broken. And really, I'm, you know, we in Musawa and the women's rights advocates that we work with in different parts of the world um, are now producing this new feminist knowledge. This whole webinar series is about this process of breaking that monopoly and taking charge of our own realities and our own futures. And um, so it is important that this new knowledge is produced, that we assert our voices to influence the way Islam is understood and used. And we are demanding an Islam that upholds equality and justice and promote the well-being of everyone. That can't be rocket science, right? <laughs> Let's now hear from Aisha from South Africa as she reflects on issues raised in Hoda's presentation and how these relate to her context today where Muslim marriages are not recognized by the laws of South Africa and where her group, the Muslim Personal Law Network, is strategizing on different actions to bring about justice to Muslim women living in a minority context and governed by uncodified laws on marriage and divorce. I'm proud to say that the MPL Network in South Africa was actually established just a few years ago, inspired by the work of Musawa and Sisters in Islam in Malaysia and our tradition of engagement both you know, with scholarship and activism to bring about change. Aisha, over to you. Assalamu alaikum. Shukran for that, Zaina. And yes, we are all inspired by the work of Musawa. Um, so if I could just give a little bit of an introduction to what the MPL Network does and who we are. We're a national network of diverse Muslim women who bring together academics, researchers, legal practitioners, and activism combined with the real lived experiences of Muslim personal law in South Africa in order to effect change in our communities. We support the need for the recognition and regulation of all marriages. And we have actively advocated for this because we have seen the effects of the non-regulation and the non-recognition of, of uh, what it's having on women and children. South Africa has a population of approximately 58 million. 
um, and Muslims make up only 2% of that population, yet we yield a very strong economic power, which is disproportionate to the numbers. We have a long history of being an apartheid regime. However, since 1994, with the birth of our democracy, we are bound by a constitution. And our constitution is the supreme law of the land. One of the underlying principles of our constitution is that all our citizens are equal in the eyes of the law. And we are all guaranteed protection from, among other things, discrimination based on gender, race, religion, and sexual orientation. Despite this, we find that South African law recognizes and regulates polygynous and same-sex marriages, but it does not recognize religious marriages. And this has left women and children disadvantaged and marginalized. Um, there has been some recognition of Muslim marriages, however, it has been on a piecemeal basis and it's taken over 20 years for us to achieve that recognition. Just to name a few examples of the selective recognition, um, the term spouse now has been extended to include uh, parties married to uh, ma uh, parties of Muslim marriage, be it monogamous or polygynous. Um, Muslim, marriage, Muslim parties are now able to um, inherit. Uh, women are able to claim from the former husband's uh, pension fund, and we have Muslim marriage officers who are able to officiate over both the civil and the religious um, marriage simultaneously, should the couple decide that they wish to enter a civil marriage. And I'm proud to say that two out of the three female Muslim marriage officers in South Africa belong to the Muslim personal network, personal law network. There's no codification of Islamic uh, law in South Africa, although there have been numerous attempts through legal reform since 1996 to have religious marriages recognized and regulated. Uh, one such application dates back as far as 2009, and that was brought initially brought to the courts by a feminist organization called the Women's Legal Center. Uh, the matter is currently on appeal, and we expect a decision in, in that uh, matter by the 28th of September, inshallah. So since um, Islamic marriages are, are not regulated in terms of civil law, and there is no compulsion to register civil marriage, the status quo is that um, religious matters are often referred to ulama bodies for assistance. These religious bodies are made up of men. They have no legal authority to enforce any Islamic rights. They are independent private bodies who are self-appointed and they are not regulated by government. Dr. Huda has shown in her paper that historically, um, laws were developed because of the needs of the time and that custom and norms influenced how the law was developed. The Quran being the guided book, but needing to be interpreted for the current context. South Africa has a rich and diverse cultural history with Islam being brought to our shores by Indian and Javanese who were brought here as slaves. Um, the oldest mosque in South Africa is in Cape Town. It's opened its doors in 1794. So in Cape Town where I'm from, we have a large Muslim population who are influenced by Indian and Javanese um, and the Malay, uh, India, Malaysia, uh, and Indonesian. And we mainly, the Cape Catonians, mainly follow the Shafi mother. Durban has a historical Zanzibar community. And like Johannesburg, they have a strong uh, um, Indian influence, but they follow the Hanafi mother. There's also a growing emerging Muslim community within South Africa. So with all this diversity, there comes challenges. And as South African citizens, we're bound by the constitution. As Muslims, our lives are regulated by Sharia. Uh, but we also have our different cultures. So the challenge lies in developing a law that satisfies all three aspects of uncodified Islamic law in South Africa. Dr. Huda has shown in her paper how women have successfully negotiated marriage contracts. And the idea of negotiating a contract is not new in South Africa. What has proven very difficult, though, is for women in Islamic marriages to try to enforce um, a verbal agreement, especially when the agreement was to conduct a marriage that was in community of property or based on equality. Upon the solution of this marriage, women are advised by these religious bodies that in terms of Sharia, the marriage is out of community of property, despite there being an agreement between the parties to conduct a marriage on a basis of equality. There have been several South African women who have successfully negotiated a written contract, a written Islamic marriage contract with all the normal ethical stipulations as mentioned by Dr. Huda. The struggle arises when the woman tries to enforce these conditions upon the solution of a marriage by divorce because 
Despite it being a signed agreement, the woman is forced to approach the, the civil courts to give uh, courts to give effect to this agreement uh, because the religious bodies have no judicial authority to enforce them. Once again, she's faced with the difficulty of reconciling Islamic law with civil law. There are marriage contracts that contain uh, tafweed clauses, but we've, you know, a lot of those tafweed clauses are conditional. So once again, giving the power to, to the, the ulama body who have to judge whether a woman actually has grounds to exercise her delegated talaq. So more like a fasakh than, than actually a, a, you know, a delegated talaq. Dr. Huda has discussed the, 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 uh, the um, sadak, the groom's gift to, to his bride. And in South Africa, um, most commonly referred to as the mahad, and it's become merely a token. In our Indian community, Meher Fatima is, Fatima is what is the most common form. And in the, more, the Malaysian community, it's more Meher Nisa, which is the, the minimum required. That's what, what I have, have found. The problem with Meher Fatima is that it's often paid in the form of gold jewelry, which is reclaimed by the in-laws, leaving the woman without access to, to her Meher or without access to her jewelry. And the option of the deferred Meher, as you have spoken about, Dr. Huda, it's not really practiced. It's not practiced. Um, that, that frequently in, in South Africa. What I did find interesting, however, in Dr. Huda's paper was how the Coptic Christians married according to Islamic Sharia in order to get, uh, gain access to divorce because according to Christianity, they were not able to divorce. So it's, it's actually the same principle that our Muslim women are currently using in South Africa because we enter civil marriage so that our marriages are recognized and there's a framework, a legislation, legislative framework that governs our marriage. It also gives us some form of security about the solution of the marriage in the form of we have access to maintenance, we can inherit it, and it's not such a long legal process. But it's not really as easy as that. Because even though they have civil marriage and they can get a civil divorce, they still find themselves married to their husbands because they refuse to give them a talaq. And talaq can't be forced. You can't force a man to give you a talaq. So that's where our network comes in. And a few of our members have assisted women in pronouncing hula. Now, hula is not widely practiced in South Africa. And in fact, some men, when the hula is pronounced, they don't even accept that the marriage is dissolved. So that brings me to my question to Dr. Huda. If, how was hula practiced how has hula worked in the Egyptian process? What are some of the challenges that it was faced? And how was it practiced outside of the courts? Because we are not practicing it in the court. For us, as the MPL network, Hadith shows that hula is possible. And it shows us, we look at the Egyptian courts, that it's granted hula without the husband's consent. So if you could possibly just elaborate a bit and explain how, how this practice has worked in the past and how we can, can use it in, in, current, um, in the current context. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Aisha, for that very rich sharing of your particular context in, in South Africa. Um, before um, we go on, let me just ask Hoda first to um, answer Aisha's specific question on hula in Egypt, how it's practiced, how well is it practiced? You know, the law was a wonderfully welcome, but in implementation, you know, is it working out well? Yeah, okay, thank you, Sara. Thank you, Aisha, and thank you, Zina. Um, in answering this question, I'll focus on how, how the law passed in the very beginning. Uh, I'm not uh, a legalist and I cannot really help or talk about how it is applied today in courts. But uh, what I can say is that it was the women's work and the, and the activist effort to pass this law. And it wouldn't have passed unless they legitimized it, legitimized it through religion when it was proven that this is in our tradition, when they used, when those women activists used history, and here comes the importance of history again, when those women activists used history and history records to prove that uh, uh, hola is part of the Islamic tradition, that hola was practiced throughout history, uh, it was only then that it was able, that they were able to pass it through the, the legislation in Egypt. Otherwise, it was not accepted. Okay, and uh, 
but how is it today in the courts? As I said, I'm, I'm not a legalist and I don't think I'm in a position to answer this, uh, this question. I have a point uh, on what you said, Aisha, very, very interesting on the Mahr, when you said that today the Sadaq is minimal and uh, it's usually taken even from the, the wife since it's in gold. And this is an important point that we need to look into or to change, to change the understanding of the wives of their mahr. This is a money that God is giving her. It's a gift that's given to her uh, to empower her, to give her a better position in bargaining, a better bargaining position in the marriage. It should be used as a tool to make her position better. It's her money it's to give her independence and uh, this was the case throughout history. Women used the mahr to have a better, yes. for example, the deferred part, it was a threat on the husband. If you don't pay, I get a divorce. And uh, it gave them financial independence that made them invest, some, some of them invested this in business, in endowment. Uh, it, it, it put them in a better position in the marital uh, relationship. So definitely you have to change the mentality of the people today and show them through history that this was not the practice the mah should be paid as a good sum, and it is for the, it's a tool for women for a better position in the marital uh, relationship. No, I agree. I agree. There really is some education needed in this regard because um, yeah. it's, it's and, not practiced. Okay. And education through our tradition, you know, because anything that comes outside, people would say this is not from the tradition. Yes. This is against our tradition. But looking into Islamic history, there's so much that can empower women. The, the mahr is a tool for empowerment. And this was the case throughout all time. So how come today you come and tell me, you give me something like a token? It should not be a token. Yeah, but that's just it. You know, that it's, it's, a, it's a clash between what Islam is and tradition and culture. Again, so it's yeah. not necessarily, and that's what people need to realize, that, you know, what does Islam say? What are our rights as a Muslim woman in Islam? as opposed to what as the traditions that's been passed down through the centuries from our forefathers. Yes, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, the, you know, in many, many countries, actually, the idea of deferred mahar is alien. It's not practiced yeah. in, in, in my country, in Malaysia, mahar is so minimal. It's just a 20 US dollars, yeah. you know? <laughs> but when they want a hulu divorce, they don't want 20 US dollars. You no. know, you buy a 20 US dollars mahar. No, they want this, that, a car, a, you know, a share of the wife's um, um, assets and, you know, money in the bank and all that, yeah. especially if the wife is a, is a, is financially independent woman, yeah? So it yeah. is... And it is a, deb a debate as well whether, you know, there are some women's groups that are against Maha because they see it as like you're purchasing a bride. Yes. But in the context of our legal framework that discriminates against women, I feel that Maha, you know, as it was designed, is a tool to protect the woman who is disempowered yes. and you know, in, in our society today, women don't earn as much as men. Women still financially are way, um, you know, behind men. So, you know, it is a tool, you know, for um, empowering women. So that's something that, you know, as we move forward with law reform, with the campaign for justice, we need to discuss um, all these issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and um, Aisha, I actually have one question for you. Um, sure. You know, I thought it was um, interesting when you said that the ulama um, council that hear all these divorce cases, marriage cases, they are self-appointed men who have actually no legal authority, um, and they're not recognized by the state. So I'm just wondering, actually, in a minority context, there is actually freedom or space for women's groups um, to organize and set up their own ulama council, their own Sharia council to hear, you know, complaints about marriage and to hear divorce cases. In India, India is like, I think probably way ahead, you know, it's a minority context, although it's got, you know, over a hundred million Muslim, it's still a minority context. But again, because, um, uh, you know, because, because the, the, the courts are not um, regulated, the women just took the you know power into their own hands and set up these Qadi courts and here and establish themselves so well that the community began to go to these all women's yeah. courts um, to 
present their cases. And these women will go after the man for the bad behavior or to grant the woman the divorce or to give her the custody of the child or to give her the NAFCA. So is that something that the groups in South Africa have thought about? I know you've now got women registering um, doing Kulok divorce, right? Yes. So that's yes. a start. So do you see that possibility of expanding and actually until you get your own laws and your own courts, you know, to actually get women to hear more of these cases? Well, we have actually, as a network, for the last three years, we've had roundtable discussions where we've actually invited these ulama to our table to hear what we have to say mm -hmm. and get them part of, you know, to maybe understand where we're coming from. Um, mm -hmm. But just, um, you know, these religious bodies, they're not, they are recognized, but they're not regulated. So the state recognizes them. So when these um, matters, when it's, you know, they, they refer to the ulama, what would you say? And the ulama thinks, you know, that they are speaking on our behalf, but they're not really speaking on our behalf. Because if, if you look at, at all the uproar and if you look at all the, the discussions in recent time, how women have been started expressing themselves, that yes, there definitely is a place for us to, to mobilize ourselves and to create this. But, you know, we've called the, the, these institutions out and we've said, your board, your, your panels are all male. You know, why are there no females on these panels? Within our network, we have so many learned women, so many women who are, are able to, to, you know, do exactly or more than what these men are doing. So as a network, we're still in a very young stage, but we are working towards that. We are raising our voice. We are advocating for reform. We're advocating for justice. And we are definitely becoming more vocal and making, and thanks to you, we are, we are now on this platform. So inshallah, it will just, you know, help us to, to help more people, more women in South Africa. Great. I, I think we should put you in touch with our network in India and, um, you know, and, and share their experience of establishing women's courts, you know, yes. to hear all these cases. Yeah, it's quite an amazing work that they've been um, doing. Yes. Um, Sarah, am I supposed to move to Q&A now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay. So we've got about 20 minutes of question and answer session and um, my colleague Sarah has clustered there are many, many, many questions I can see here. Um, so what she has done is to cluster the questions to save time so that, um, you know, Hoda or Aisha can um, respond to them um, you know, a few at a time. So the first big cluster of questions um, is on women's agency and court negotiations in pre-modern Egypt, um, Hoda. Um, so um, you, like the list of questions includes whether women spoke for themselves or did they have an intermediary when they negotiated the marriage contract? Um, you know, and what enabled the women to put these kinds of conditions? Is it the class, the, uh, you know, it, it was class a very important um, condition, um, uh, enabling condition, you know, that allowed these women to put these incredible conditions in the marriage contract? Um, some wanted to know about um, what the court records reveal about divorce um, negotiations. What were the most common conflicts um, that the courts heard? Um, and there's a question here. Um, my question is, when did this, when did it all begin to go bad, I guess? Um, was it during the colonial period? Um, you know, how, how, you know, uh, you know, because this is a question by Professor Khalid, because I can see women's voices in fit sources as well, Professor Khalid said, but patriarchal authority is an enigma. <laughs> is it really an enigma? Um, Hoda, if you can respond to this um, cluster of questions. Okay. Oh, another one on this is how were women able to monetize husband's obligations to man maintain the wife? So this whole bunch on um, negotiations, yeah? Yeah, so I can, start, I can start first by the contracts and the conditions of marriage. The conditions mm -hmm. of marriage were very common in, uh, in contracts throughout history, early and medieval. Mm -hmm. And uh, definitely there is a plus element, definitely. Mm -hmm. 
and the elite women had more access to uh, more rights or uh, uh, the, the, the contracts, many of the contracts still, the, the contracts have the same problem of the uh, traditional sources, that definitely the contracts that are, uh, many of the contracts that are recorded belong to uh, elite women or the people who had the, the luxury to go and record their, uh, their, uh, their rights were women of the elite. Uh, yet, the medieval period, there's an interesting study by uh, Yusuf Rapaport on marriage, money, and divorce in medieval Egypt. And he found out that in medieval Egypt, uh, even the non-elite women, the working women, the ones who were working in the textile industries, they uh, had conditions in their, uh, in their contracts as well. Uh, the other thing is uh, contracts were women, it was the right of the women, it was a common practice. And in, one, in some of the contracts, you find that the, the, the sadaq was very minimal or low. And this shows that those people did not belong to the elite. Yes, there are many contracts with very high uh, amah, which shows that the wife was of a high standing, in a high standing position. Yet there are other cases or other contracts that showed that women were, uh, were not really uh, uh, or, or that the husband and the wife were not of, a, of were not belong to the elite uh, circle because the sum of money was minimum or little. This is one thing. So yes, definitely there's a class element, but there are cases of non-elite people who added their uh, conditions and uh, women were vocal about it. There's an interesting case also of uh, this common wife who went to the Sultan and was vocal about her rights and asked him to punish her husband because he uh, took a second wife. And she's a common poor woman, yet she was aware of her right and knew that this is a condition that has to be respected in a contract. It's binding, okay? So this is for the contracts. What other questions, Zena, remind me? The other question has to do with Yeah, the... uh, I think there's an important question here about like, when did all this begin to change? When suddenly you don't hear, I mean, today, the idea of negotiating your marriage contract is like radical, <laughs> you know, wanting to put conditions, additional conditions and all that. It's a struggle to do that, to get your family, to get your groom to agree, to get this family to agree, and then to get the Qadi who's going to marry you to agree, it is a struggle. So when did all this, do you have, like in terms of your work and your research, like when did you notice a change began? Yes, in general, I can, I can give you a general view. Mm -hmm. uh, things were very flexible up to the Ottoman time. On the, on the level, on the, on, the, on the formulation level. And with the Ottoman Empire, and we had the, what we call the uh, institutionalization of religion. When we started having the mufti of the empire, his, the, the Sheikh al-Islam, when we started having one source of authority and one source of a spokesperson of Islam, this definitely started to uh, limit the options for the women or to mm -hmm. uh, end this spaceness or this, the, the space that women had in the past. However, it should be noted clearly that even despite of this on the upper level, yet women during Ottoman time were extremely active. And the Ottoman court records give us a different image than the image of the official uh, records. So still, uh, the more you go in time and after the modern state, I would say that this problem started to take place with the colonialization, with the modern state, with the uh, codifications of the laws. This uh, started to be a problem. Mm. So at the beginning, I, I see it at the beginning, it was more uh, open. We had different schools, you had uh, diversities, uh, uh, a very dynamic society. And then when you go to the Ottoman Empire, this is the beginning with the institutionalization, yet it did not affect the, the, the level of the people, the, the lived reality of the people. But then the more we go in time and we move to the modern state and the codifications of the laws, I would say this started to, to take place, but my specialization is not the modern time, so I cannot really talk about this era. I, I guess it's really quite ironic, isn't it? In the modern times, 
um, you know, it, it's more difficult. I guess authority is so concentrated in the modern nation state, in the power, yeah. and who is in power, right? Who, who are the people who hold power and the authority to, um, you know, to, to, to interpret Islam, to codify it into law, to implement it, you know, and yeah. it's patriarchal men in authority, that power, formal power is in their hands and they used it in ways that, you know, just don't reflect the realities of women's lives today. And, and instead of multiple voices, the nation state, it's one voice. So yes. also yes. put yes. more women. Well, that's why, like you said, it's so important for us women, you know, we want change. We can't expect change to be served to us on a silver platter. It's up to us to organize and to really push um, for change and get our voices um, heard. Okay, second um, um, cluster of question, um, you know, there's a, about like what particular kind of profile of women, what kind of women were depicted in the historical sources? This, this, this cluster of questions is on historical sources. And the other one is the critique. There is a critique in the literature um, that non-conventional sources on marriage and gender practices, um, the, 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 the vol it's a small volume, yeah? It's not large. And therefore, we shouldn't generalize. I'm sure this is from men, right? What do you think? <laughs> you know, like, okay, it doesn't serve their interests. So, you know, we shouldn't make generalizations, you know, because we're so excited about all these findings. Oh, don't generalize because it's small and it's not representative. <laughs> yes. Uh, can, can, I, can you repeat again the first part of the question? Um, is what kind of women were depicted in the historical sources? Oh. Was there a particular kind of profile of ah. women? Yeah, interesting. So I'll start first by the first question. Uh, in the conventional sources, it's the, the, the elite women, definitely. The ones who were uh, related to the elite or the, 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 the wife of a alim, a sheikh, or the wife of a sultan, or the people around them. It's the elite women who were uh, recorded. Even the early uh, biographical dictionaries recorded biographical dictionaries of as sahabiyat the women around the prophet and the, the, the companions of the prophet. Uh, so we get uh, to know more about elite women educated women. While in the non-conventional, we hear the voice of the non-elite women. And for example, the, the, the ones in the, uh, the court records, not only the court records, but the, 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 the Geniza documents, the, uh, there are the Red Sea documents that through them, while reading them, you can get uh, a glimpse on the activities, the economic activities of women. Uh, even the legal sources, they tell us, so it's, it's the legal and the non-legal sources uh, in the fatawa, the fatawa, we hear the voice of women asking questions and waiting for an answer. So in the non-conventional sources, it's, you hear the voice of the non-elite women, definitely. So I would say that both were represented, the elite and the non-elite. As for the other question, we don't need to generalize. I agree, we should never generalize anything and we should always be cautious. And I'm not trying to say that the early Islamic period was it's the golden age period. No, they had their issues, there are problems. But what I'm trying to say is that it's a huge thing. We should not simplify. Yes, we should not generalize, but we should not simplify. It's a huge empire with different uh, models, with different examples, with thousands and thousands of women. and. Uh, not one case should be applied to all. And uh, we need to look further into more and more women. Uh, as for where the non-conventional source is limited, I would say they're not limited because day after day, we find new and unconventional sources that add to our knowledge, like the Haram collections, uh, like the uh, endowment deeds, like the, the, the endowment deeds, this is a treasure that tells us so much about women's uh, economic agency and how independent, financially independent they were. Like the, uh, the papyrus, like there are so many unconventional sources that are even discovered day after day that give us a good image of what was taking place. So I'm not saying that we generalize this. No, definitely there are cases of restrictions and rigidity and uh, toughness, definitely. But there are also good cases. So the thing is, why don't why we only pick the, the tough and the rigid cases? 
Yeah. This is the only thing. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So this is what I'm trying to say. It's not that everything was rosy and that the history is full yeah. of bright examples. Yeah. No, at all. There are very rigid cases and there are tough rules, but there's, there, was, there were too many options in the past that we are deprived of today. Yeah. I know. So that's the issue, really, isn't it? Because when we are, when we speak out and we demand rights and we, I mean, Sisters in Islam, I don't know, like 15 years ago, launched a campaign to put in the marriage contract that the wife has a right to um, to apply. We didn't even say automatic divorce. The, the wife has a right to ask for divorce should the husband take a second wife. And she doesn't agree with that arrangement and she's not happy with that arrangement. We were attacked on the front pages of the newspapers. This is against Islam, it's un Islamic. When actually the evidence shows that this is very much a part of the Muslim tradition from the earliest period. Exactly. And the same with the Khul'a in Egypt, the same thing. It was only yeah. passed when it was proven that it's part of the tradition. So yeah. the tradition, there's so much in the tradition. And it depends on who is selecting. And right. the problem is that it's the monopoly of men and men who are selecting right. today. So I would yeah. say women should select. And again, for this question, definitely I'm not saying that everything was perfect and uh, yeah. one case means that every, everybody was happily living. No. Or there was gender equality at all. But there mm -hmm. were different options and there were different examples and there was this tension that led to more dynamism in society yeah okay. yeah but if i can just um, make a comment there uh, dr Huda, you're speaking about it's the elite women and we find the same thing in south africa it's those women who can afford to go to the courts who's actually challenging this the status quo but the the, the the poorer woman or the the lower class woman or you know that that doesn't have the funds we they just have to accept what what they're given they just have to uh, you know they can't challenge the the position and that's why we as as the MPL network we actually look at the lived experience of the woman you know that 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 ordinary woman and see what we can do how we can amplify her voice not just one person because there are so many women that are doing it so yeah. I think the, the elite have the funds, the financial capabilities to challenge it, but the, the, the ordinary woman's voice is a louder voice that, that really needs to be amplified more. Thank you, Aisha. There is one question here for you, um, and it's from also a minority context um, in the UK. Why do South African women not have their marriages registered through civil law as in the UK, because you can actually do that, right? So that they can secure their legal rights on divorce through the law of the land. And why don't they have their Islamic marriage contracts witnessed by and turned into legal documents through a solicitor so that it becomes a legal document in law? Um, surely we can use both processes in order to achieve equality under the law. And this is not an Islamic. Um, so, so did you have a response to, to that? Is it, yeah. why is it that people are not registering their marriage, their religious marriage under civil law as well? Look, there's, firstly, there's no compulsion to register a civil marriage. So it would be a decision by the couple. And women, you know, we find that we don't really have that bargaining power here. We can't force the man to enter into a civil marriage. So that's one. Then we, we do have cases of women where they have their marriage contacts and they have all the stipulations, um, you know, but then, and it is witnessed and all of those things, but those contracts, we find it difficult to enforce it even in the, in the South African court because it's, it's religion, it's based on religion and our courts can't adjudicate matters on religion. You know, mm -hmm. so, so that's the difficulty that we have. But we do have women who successfully they, they enter into a civil marriage. So they do have their rights. They have all of those things. Um, and then they do have their, their Islamic marriage. Um, one an issue that we have with uh, couples who want to have their um, contacts, their antinuptial contacts notarized. The, the Leeds office will not notarize any, any contract that has any, any clauses, any religious clauses in it. So it needs to be a stock standard, uh, an antinuptial contract that conforms to the civil aspect of the, um, but anything with the, with the religious aspect, they, they will not register. So that, those are some of the things that we as the MPL network, what we are challenging, what we're trying to, um, to you know, get some change in, but it is a, it is a struggle for, for women, Muslim yeah. women in particular. Yeah, and I think also in many countries where Muslim women or Muslims, really, the Muslim community um, is allowed, especially in minority contexts, you can opt out of Sharia, of, of, is, of, of the Muslim family law and go to the civil court. Very often culture 
you know yes. doesn't allow you that you know to to do that you know so like you said you know pressure from the family pressure from the husband um so the law might be there to enable you but unless um you know women are empowered and enabled to do so very often the culture of the community yes. prevents women from accessing those rights under the law well, I mean, we are, we, we, in the culture, the tradition here is, you know, where you, the area you are given, that's where you die, you know, it's just a, a little <laughs> translation of, you know, so you, you, you get given to your, to your in-laws and that's, that's where you remain. There's a the stigma attached to divorces, you know, um, yeah, yeah. and who does, you know, has, has so beautifully said in her, in a paper also that in, in, in the medieval, in Egyptian times, they, they were not forced to remain in a marriage that they were not happy with, you yeah. know, that they were not happy in. And yeah, in, in our context, we find that the, our daughters are told stay. When you go to the, to the ulama, they say, sister, uh, Allah is most displeased with divorce. You must suffer, <laughs> exercise patience. We will suffer until we end up in our qabr. <laughs> yes, we hear that. I think all over, everybody shares that same story. You know, when the woman goes to court to apply for divorce, why do you want to bring down a mosque? Divorce is like bringing down a mosque. The, but the man has the right to just pronounce divorce, divorce, divorce. And the woman is divorced, but when a woman wants it, it's equivalent to bringing down, demol demolishing yeah. a whole mosque, right? And she has to have uh, proof grounds for the divorce, you know? <laughs> yes, yeah. and she has to prove as if the criminal evidence, yeah, the weight yes. of evidence demanded. Yes. Anyway, just one last question on Sadaq. Um, the questions are rather long and too many, so I'm just going to try and pick up one, um, um, one or two. Um, this deferred method of sadaq payment is this somebody is asking whether it's different from nafaka and the other question is if the husband died before who, he could pay out the deferred sadaq i guess the sadaq in full could was it claimable from his estate um, yeah. in addition to the farah aid portion of the estate can she claim the the deferred um, sadaq that the husband has not paid yeah Yes, very interesting. Actually, I was just reading this question and I wanted to answer it. Mm -hmm. uh, in Egypt, the, when, when uh, the practice was deferring sadaq to the termination of marriage, uh, the, nafaka, the nafaka was marginalized. And this, mm -hmm. and I think this would upset the fuqaha in Medina. And this mm -hmm. is a proof of the flexibility and the changes in the, in the laws. Even the nafaka, which is, uh, which is a must in a marriage, in, in, after divorce, it was marginalized in Egypt because the deferred portion uh, acted as or played the same role of the nafaka. Uh, mm -hmm. Yet in Medina, for example, no, the nafaka was still on. Mm -hmm. In Egypt, it was it was marginalized. It was not mm -hmm. common. The common thing was the deferred portion. Mm -hmm. the, the nafaka was marginalized. Mm -hmm. As for the other question, and it was. Uh, if the man dies, if the husband oh, dies, yeah, yeah. Um, it is reclaimable. Yeah, yeah, it is reclaimable. Before the inheritance, before distributing the shares, they would mm -hmm. cut out the, the 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 this deferred portion. Oh, that's interesting. So wife. it's regarded like a debt that the yeah. husband owes, um, exactly. and and therefore the estate must pay up all those debts first. Yeah, yeah. Is, is, this, is that still practiced today in Egypt? No, I don't think. I'm not sure, and I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's practiced in Egypt. In the past, it was a debt. It was a debt. And that's why when it was paid upon request in medieval time, the, husband, mm. the wife could sue her husband because it's a debt that he has to yeah, pay. Right. And if he dies without paying, it's taken from his, from the, yeah. the estate or whatever. Yes, before yeah. dividing the shares, yeah. they give her the... But the, the, what the, happens, the, what happens if, if when he dies, his estate is not worth anything? <laughs> 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 I think I think the inheritance has nothing during a marriage and nothing afterwards either. <laughs> yes, I guess she gets nothing out of it. <laughs> I, I would say that it's it it would it should follow the, the rules of inheritance. So the, the family should pay her this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the inheritors, the, the, the sons or whatever, or the the uncles or whatever should pay her. It's it's her right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I need to 
time is running out and I need to um, make some concluding um, comments. Really, thank you so much, Hoda. Thank you so much, um, Aisha, for this amazingly rich um, discussion and, and sharing. And I guess for us moving forward is how do we strategically use um, Hoda's research findings to, to, to support our campaign for justice for, for Muslim women, yeah? And, and I think it's just, you know, important for us to remember some of the key points that, that Hoda made. The fact is Islamic law was responsive to the prevailing social norms, contexts, and conditions of those times. In the 21st century, how can Islamic law be responsive to the realities of our times? The jurists develop legal tools and mechanisms to enable law to change and adapt to changing circumstances. Why aren't we using these tools of maslaha, of public interest, of differences of opinion, of ijtihad to you know, change in the way that we understand Islam, to change in the way that the laws have been formulated, to develop new laws that you know, that, that serve the, the objectives of what justice means in the 21st century. Justice in the 21st century is not the same as justice in the 10th century, yeah? When women, you know, are out there in the public space, women are financially independent, women are educated, women are working, women are providers and protectors of the family. The medieval period also showed that women had rights and agency to negotiate the kind of marriage that they wanted. Why is it now when we want to add all you know, things into the marriage contract or demand for change, we're told we have no right to do that. Everything is fixed, you know, that was perfect, you know, the, but the Fuka has said they never expected their word to be the law you know, for all times, you know, that was the law and their opinion in that particular time and that particular context, yeah? And Hoda also shared the court records and marriage contracts that women were empowered and demanded protection of their rights. This was the medieval period of Islamic history. What has happened to the Muslim world today? You know, that women's groups demanding reform towards equality and justice are accused of being westernized feminists, imposing alien Western values on poor and helpless Muslim women. Excuse me, look at our own history. Bring that history to the fore. And really, I always believe that if we had followed the trajectory of the Islamic message in the Quran, um, that talks about kindness and compassion all the time, about men and women being each other's friend and protector. And if we had followed the tradition of diversity of opinions in our legal tradition, the need to choose the best opinion in order that justice is served, the importance of the common good, of public good, the Muslim world today really should be at the forefront of the feminist movement. These are empowering messages, yeah, and yet, we find today in various gender equality surveys, the tra tragedy of which countries are at the bottom. At least 20 to 21 countries of the bottom 25 countries of these gender equality surveys are Muslim majority countries. And they include high middle income countries, not just the poor countries, rich Muslim countries are at the bottom of gender equality service. Why? One major reason is because their family laws continue to discriminate against women, right? Their religion, culture, and tradition remain discriminatory. Without equality in the family, there can be no equality for women in the public sphere. It's as real as that. The kind of research that Hoda is doing Zainab, um, you are muted, so please unmute yourself. <clears throat> Suddenly happened? Okay, um, where was I? Yeah, the kind of research um, that Hoda is doing, the kind of activism that Aisha and her group in South Africa is engaged in, is the kind of scholarship and activism that Musawa is fostering, and that is what we need in the Muslim world today. We, as Huda kept saying, and again and again, we need to break the monopoly and the hegemony of the patriarchs and their hold on religious authority, religious power, religious knowledge. We need to build our knowledge and speak out. This is a 21st century. 
a legal framework that regards men as providers and protectors to whom women owe their obedience no longer reflects the realities of our lives today. Women today are also providers and protectors of their family. This, this, this continued disconnect between the family law that governs us and the reality of our lives today cannot continue because it does the family harm. It does the nation harm. We need to assert our voices and rewrite a different her story, not his story, her story to make our case for reform and to build public support and galvanize global momentum towards the possibility, the urgent necessity and equality and justice for women living in Muslim context. Really the time for change is, enough, is now, enough is enough. Women will not wait anymore. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Hoda. Thank you. Very well said. Thank you very much. And thank you, Aisha. Thank, thank you. you. I hand you, over to thank you. Sarah for some housekeeping. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Don't sign off yet. We have a few more things, um, housekeeping to do. Sarah? Thank you so much, Zaina. Thank you, Huda, Aisha, for this fascinating conversation that really helped us to debunk our assumptions about Muslim marriage practices and laws, not only in medieval Egypt, but also in South Africa. And we all learned a lot from this lived history, like Zaina said, enough is enough. We're not longer waiting, but we're in the process of rewriting her story. I also want to thank our audience for your constructive and valuable questions. If you enjoyed this webinar, there will be more on contemporary laws, ahadith, Quran coming soon, and we hope you will be able to join us inshallah before you leave i will ask you to please answer two questions in our poll that uh, suri just launched now you uh, should be able to see that in your screen i also would like to thank the amazing team that is behind the organization of this webinar suri zul hishama alex mulki ziba jana and many others in the musawa secretariat the recording will be available on YouTube in the coming week, inshallah. And if you have any follow-up questions about this webinar, the series, or the research initiative, you can email us at sarah at musawa.org. So I will be waiting a little bit until we have you all answer the poll. Thank you again, uh, Aisha, Huda, and Zaina. Thank, thank, thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Huda. Thank, thank you, Aisha. Wonderful to have you with us. Thank, thank you for having me, Zaina. Thank you very much. Thank you.